Picking back up with the, my Calvinist, Calvinism series, this will probably be the last one. I really don't have that much more interest in the, in the topic of Calvinism, but um, I don't think I really hit this. And, you know, the five points, if, you, you know, if you're going about the five points, they're all very interrelated anyways. And this is how it is really with all doctrine in general from the Bible is that there's a, a lot of just individual doctrines that play a part in every other doctrine. So in order to make sure that you're understanding the Bible and rightly dividing the word of truth, everything needs to fit. You can't, you can't have a doctrine that's going to cause you to have a contradiction somewhere else in God's word or else you're misunderstanding something. Because if you're going to have, start to have all these different contradictions, then you know, either it's not God's word or you're not understanding it properly. Now, you know, the sermon's not about this at all. Obviously, we know that God's word is perfect. We don't, we don't need to, to, to question that anymore. If you're here accept, and we're accepting of, of God's word, then when we come across something that might seem like a contradiction, or if we understand a certain doctrine that doesn't really hold up in light of other scripture, then we need to question that doctrine and see if it works. So, the, you know, when it comes to Calvinism, you really need all five points in order to try to make that the, the whole doctrine hold any type of water. And when you shoot a hole in one of them, it's going to have rippling effects and impact everything else because they all are interdependent on one another, I believe. You know, some people say I'm only a three-point Calvinist or a two-point Calvinist or whatever. I don't really see how you can be, uh, how that makes sense logically. I, I don't see how you can follow through on the entire doctrine without just embracing all of it. Now, it's all false doctrine. All five points are not true. And tonight, I'm going to be dealing with the, the limited atonement aspect of the Calvinist doctrine. And I always like trying, you know, when, when I teach these sermons, one, I like just teaching exactly what the Bible says, because that's what we're here for, what I learned from the Bible. But when I'm going against or trying to, to answer or refute a false doctrine that is prevalent. And, and let's be honest, Calvinism is a very prevalent doctrine, unfortunately, in many churches. It's been around for a really long time. This isn't something that's just brand new. It's been around for a while, this type of teaching. And um, it, it needs to be addressed. So what I usually like to do, and what I did tonight also, is I, I have just, just plenty of scripture. It's just plain. You can take it at face value for what it says that refutes this doctrine. But I also like to see, well, what are they... What are they claiming? Where is their evidence? What are they going to say? Because I, I, would, I would hate to just miss something and then, you know, a person who sucked into this says, well, you didn't answer this. Now, I'm never going to be able to answer everything, but try to find some of the best arguments. And we started off here in John chapter 10, and I'll be honest where I got my source from this evening because it's really, it's really painful finding these hardcore Calvinists and trying to wade through their nonsense. On, like, it really is. It's, they have so much double speak, and so and, and and a lot of it's just just flat out boring, and it's a lot of words to say not very much at all. So, I got this off of Wikipedia, okay, and and it's actually a pretty good summary because I am I'm already familiar with Calvinism. I know what they teach. I was brought up in a Presbyterian church, and the Presbyterian church is a Reformed Catholic church that follows the teachings of John Calvin. I mean, at least mine did. When I went through two years of confirmation classes, we studied John Calvin, John Knox, Wesley, you know, all these various people that were part of the Reformation, Martin Luther. But John Calvin had the heaviest influence into the Presbyterian church. That was like his sect, just like the Lutherans followed Martin Luther more. Well, the Presbyterians followed John Calvin. He was like their, you know, founding father, if you will. Well, one of them. And, uh... So I've learned a lot about this, but I like to be able to approach it and say, here's what they're saying, and this is what the Bible says. So the, the main summary here, and I'm going to read this verbatim from the, from the Wikipedia page. And the Wikipedia page, I checked the sources on it too. It's all sourced from, from uh, you know, re reformed writers and people who subscribe to this type of theology. It's not, it's, it's not a hit piece by somebody else, right? It's, it's, it, it, it's what I've ever, ever heard you know, these people say. So uh, that all being said, I'm just going to read you for these, um, what, what that page said. It said, formally, the Calvinist position can be expressed this way. And this was just in regards to limited atonement, mind you. You know, it wasn't any of the other points. So it was just for this one. 
And it's regarding this John chapter 10 passage that we just read. And we're going to go into this, into this more in depth. They say, Jesus, it says one, Jesus lays down his life for the sheep. Two, Jesus will lose none of his sheep. Three, many people will not receive eternal life. Therefore, the Calvinist position is that Jesus did not die for everyone, but only for those whom the Father purposed to save. So that's what limited atonement really means, that the atonement of Jesus Christ is limited to only the people who are called the elect or the saved, okay? That, that that was the only people that Jesus died for are those that God already ordained to be saved, the, the ones that God has chosen to become saved, that Jesus didn't die for anyone else but just for those. And, that, and with all of the Calvinist doctrines, it's way too much thought, man's interpretation and man's wisdom going into Scripture to the point to where they, they really wrap their head around this and they get all screwed up and it just flies in the face of what the Scripture is plainly teaching. They try to get in so deep that they get all twisted around and it's like, just, just look at it for what it says. Look at this, the spirit of the Bible. Look at what it's teaching us and why it's using this. And, you know, every false doctrine, they always, always, always are going to twist parables. What Jesus is doing here when he's using a sheep and a shepherd. Look, are we physically sheep? No, we're physically people. He even says in this, in this passage, he says, I am the door. Is Jesus Christ physically a door? No, he's the son of God. He's using these as illustrations because especially in, in the vast majority of human history, there's been a lot of people who keep sheep and it's something that was just common knowledge for many, many, many years. Now, we in just recent years have kind of strayed away from having this as common knowledge, but even the examples that are used are not so like we're not so far removed that we don't even get what he's trying to say here. We could have this understanding with just very little education. You can still get it, what, what he's teaching. Now, the more you know about shepherding or keeping sheep, you can gain a little bit more understanding of this because, the, you know, just some little minor nuances, but it's not like you're losing some major truth by not being a shepherd. Okay, sheep are animals that are very domesticated. And when you have a shepherd, he, and he's just really explaining this, you know, that, that takes care of the sheep all the time, the sheep will respond, they understand and they hear that voice. And this is, this is something that, that naturally happens in life with real shepherds and real sheep. That sheep hear that voice of the shepherd and, and will listen to his direction and follow that voice. And when they get lost, he calls out to them, you know, that they'll come back from where they are when they hear the voice. And when there's other people calling out to them, they don't do that because they don't know that voice. This is something that happens for real. I mean, this is real life. And he's using this as an illustration to explain who he, is, who he is. And what the Calvinists do, though, is they'll take this and pick it apart and try to say, you know, like they, they take this, this, this explanation way too deep into meaning way more than it really does, as if this embodies everything that has to do with salvation in this one parable. Any example that you give, any illustration that you give about a concept such as salvation and eternal life is going to fall apart at some point. But you have to just accept what is being given for the purpose it's being given. So a perfect example of this is eternal life is referred to as a free gift. Multiple times in the Bible, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, Romans 6, 23, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ the Lord. It uses that example of a gift because we understand what a gift is. It's something that is not earned. It's not merited. It's something that's given for free and that you just have to accept in order to receive it. Very simple concept. But then you always have the people that say, well, you could throw away your gift or you could do this to a gift. It's like, look, 
Eternal life isn't a tangible object that you're going to take and you could light it on fire and burn it and destroy it. You're missing the whole point of why he's telling you it's a gift. It's not because every single possible scenario that you could think of that could maybe happen with some gift that you receive physically in this world applies to salvation. You just have to accept the, the point that's being given. And anybody with a brain can just get the surface meaning of what the Bible is saying here without having to dive in so deep to where now you're twisting the doctrine around. So let's look at John chapter 10 and just understand what it's teaching us, okay? Because what they do is, and we already read the points, but they say, see, Jesus lays down his life for the sheep because that's what he said. I laid down my life for the sheep, which means he's only laying his life, and see, and this is where the interpretation comes in. He's only laying his life down for the sheep because it says he's not going to lose any of his sheep. He's laying his life down for the sheep. Well, who are the sheep? Well, if he's not losing any, then the sheep can't be everybody because we know that some people, many people are going to hell. That's their logic. That's where they come up with and spin, well, then he must not have died for everybody off of a parable. And they have many other, and we're going to get to, to the other points that they have too, but this was the, the summary. This was the expression of the belief. Let's look at John chapter 10, verse number 1. The Bible reads, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This is a true attribute of sheep and shepherds, and this is perfectly legitimate to apply to people who are believers in Christ and following Jesus and hearing his voice and hearing his words. We could hear from the Bible. We're not going to follow someone else. Matches up perfectly with when the Antichrist comes in in Matthew 24. It explains that uh, there's going to be many signs and wonders that are done and in so much that if it were possible, he shall deceive the very elect, meaning it's not possible. Why? Because we're Jesus is sheep, and we're going to hear his voice, and another we're not going to follow. Someone else claiming to be Christ, someone else claiming to be the shepherd, we're not going to follow his voice because we are Jesus' sheep. Now, again, there's nothing wrong with that. This isn't saying who he died for and everything else just yet. We're going to get into that a little bit, but it's, it's, it's fine. You know, there's, this is what it's saying. Verse number six, this parable, this parable, again, the Bible's telling us it's a parable, this parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Then said Jesus unto them again, verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. So first he's saying he's a shepherd, now he's saying I'm the door. He's getting different points across. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers. Why? They tried to go in some other way because they weren't going in through Jesus. But the sheep did not hear them. The believers aren't going after these antichrists. He said, before Christ came, there were other people claiming to be Christ. Other antichrists. His sheep didn't follow him. They didn't go after him. Verse 9, I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Now, first of all, we have to understand is everything he's saying here is true. Absolutely. There's nothing, you know, there's nothing um, untrue about this. But he's saying, I'm the good shepherd. There are many people who can be shepherds over flocks, but they're not all necessarily good. He's saying, I'm the good shepherd because I'm willing to give my life for them. This is a reality of, of shepherds in general. That's why he talks about the hireling in verse number 12. He says, but he that is in hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth because he is in hireling and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. So the difference he's making here is that the shepherd is the one who owns the flock. 
they belong to me so because they belong to me I'm invested in them and I'm gonna fight for them and stand up for them and give my life for them but the hireling someone who's you know you just hired somebody hey can you watch over these for me they're not gonna give their life for them I mean think about this if you owned you know a restaurant or if you owned some other business and someone comes in and and they want to steal you know all your money you're just an employer you'd be like go ahead take it you know my life's not worth this it's not my money anyways right I mean you're just working for someone else but the person who owns the place is gonna be a lot more likely to be more possessive over their own business and over their own money because no that's mine I'm not gonna let you just come in and do this right I mean and this is the point that he's getting across Jesus Christ is that good shepherd. He's like, I'm not going to let the wolf come in and scatter you guys. I'm watching out for you. I'll give my life for you because I'm the good shepherd. This isn't explaining that, I mean, you really have to dig deep to try to say that, oh, this, he's only going to give his life to pay for the sins of a few people. It's not what it's saying at all. It simply isn't there. Let's keep reading though. Verse number 15. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Look at this, though, in verse 16, because this is real interesting. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I, I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Now he's referring to sheep that haven't even heard his voice yet, but are going to hear his voice in the future. So this is, and again, it's still within the context of this parable, he's talking about, and what, I mean, what he's really talking about is not of this fold, he's talking about the children of Israel. Because he came unto his own, and his own received him not, and then he opened up everything to the Gentiles, and that whole, that whole issue, he says, here's this fold, this is who I'm going to, but then there's going to be also people who are going to hear my voice, and there's going to be one fold and one shepherd over all of them. That's the common understanding of what, of what this is teaching. Verse 17, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. And what this does not do or imply is explicitly say, I'm not laying down my life for those who to have an opportunity to become my sheep. Because this is where the contention comes in anyways. Because you can just say, okay, everything this is plainly saying is that, yeah, he's giving his life for anybody who is saved or will be saved. Fine. But this is not saying he's excluding anyone else from having that opportunity. And this is the, this is the big difference that the Calvinist draws is that, nope, it says this, this is, that's all he ever died for because of this parable being a shepherd for his sheep. Let's jump down to verse number 19. Well, we're, the next verse, or num, uh, number 19, because this is going to be important also when we're studying this limited atonement. Verse 19, there was a division, therefore, among the Jews for these sayings. And many of them said, He hath a devil and is mad. Why hear ye him? Now, just remember that, because we're going to get to that in a little bit, that they were saying, He hath a devil. Talking about Jesus just teaching about being the good shepherd. He hath the devil and is mad, and why hear ye him? Others said, these are not the words of him that hath the devil. Can a devil open the eyes of the blind? And it was at Jerusalem, uh, the feast of the dedication, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us d to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and ye believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep. As I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. And of course, they don't like that either, and they want to stone them with stones. But... This is the, the parable that they are using to justify a belief in, their, in, in limited atonement. At least one of them. And as I mentioned, you know, false doctrine always starts with a parable. 
Let's look at some clear scriptures now that prove this doctrine false. Because if that's all we had in the Bible to go off of, that's not very much. You could come up with all kinds of different things that this might mean. Right? I mean, you're looking at a parable. How do you know where the, the parable ends and what truth we can really get from this one parable? How do we draw the bounds? How do we interpret this parable to have a full understanding of his reference with salvation and eternal life? And what does this all mean? Well, we need other scripture to help us out with that because that one parable is not enough ever. Turn, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. I'll read for you from John chapter 1. I know you're just in John chapter 10. John chapter 1, verse 29. The Bible reads, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Remind, remind you, limited atonement is supposed to be Jesus only died for some people. He only died for those who would be saved not for everyone. Well, if Jesus didn't die and pay for the punishment of everybody, then why did John the Baptist say, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world? The sin of everybody. I mean, what, what, what other context are you going to say the world means a believer? 1 Timothy 4, look at verse number 10. 1 Timothy 4.10 For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men especially of those that believe. So Jesus Christ is the Savior. He is the Savior not only of those that believe, but the Savior of all men, because he makes a distinction here. He says he's the Savior of all men, but then there's a special category for those that believe. Why is it special for those that believe? Because those people are saved. Because he has saved those people. He is the Savior to everybody, but not everybody is saved. Those that believe are saved. He saves them because they believe on him. He is still the Savior because he still died and paid for the sins of the world. Amen. I don't see how you can look at these verses and, and go turn you to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. And make a clear distinction. I mean, make a clear distinction. He's the Savior of all men, and then especially of those that believe. So all men and those that believe are in two different categories. But, and what they're claiming is that he only died for those that believe. Then how could he be the Savior of all men, meaning the unbelievers as well? How can he be their Savior if he didn't die for their sins? How can he be? How can anybody be their Savior if nobody died and paid for their sins? It's impossible. He He's the Savior of all men. The only way he can be the Savior is because of that atonement that he made. 2 Peter verse, chapter 3, verse 9, we see the, the, the spirit in the heart of God. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, word, not willing. It means he doesn't want it. It's not God's will or his desire that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. If God doesn't want anybody to perish, then why would Jesus only pay for certain people's sins? Doesn't make any sense. Again, you have a contradiction in understanding here of the Scripture. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 12. I'll read from John 12 for you. John 12, 32, Jesus Christ said, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me, this he said, signifying what death he should die. Jesus Christ is trying to dry, dry, draw everybody to him. Everyone. The whole world. Matthew chapter 12. I'm going to get into this briefly. Maybe not so briefly. I'm going to go into this a little bit, actually kind of in depth. But it's important because... The reprobate doctrine goes hand in hand to some people with this limited atonement thing. And we get accused of believing or being a Calvinist or believing in limited atonement because we believe the, the doctrine that the Bible clearly teaches that some people are rejected of God, that some people become reprobate and it becomes impossible for them to be saved. And I'll explain to you a little bit more about that, but I want you to, we're going to read in Matthew chapter 12. Right now, remember, 
the last passage that we, had, that we looked at in John chapter 10 when they said, He hath a devil, and they were speaking about Jesus having a devil. Look at Matthew 12, verse 24. The Bible reads, But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. So again, they're, they're accusing Jesus of having devils and working for Satan and you know, working for Beelzebub. Verse 25, And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself, how shall then his kingdom stand? And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Or else how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house? He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Wherefore I say unto you, All manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by his fruit, O generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of, his, of the heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. This passage is talking about the unforgivable sin, as it's known in the Bible, blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. And what we see in the context, which is why we read it in context, is that Jesus was, was saying this, and he was explaining what the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost is because they had said that Jesus Christ had devils, and that he only cast out devils through the power of, the, you know, of Beelzebub, the prince of the devils, because, that was be the, because he's not of God, is what they're saying. And them seeing his actions, seeing what he's doing, seeing the power of God, hearing the Son of God preach, and calling him a devil, Jesus said, you're blaspheming the Holy Ghost. Because they're seeing the power of the Holy Ghost. They're, they're, they're hearing the preaching of the Holy Ghost through Jesus Christ, and they're blaspheming that. And he says, you know what? You could, you could say whatever about me. You could say whatever about you know, uh, you know, other things, you blaspheme, but you blaspheme the Holy Ghost, and he says, you don't have forgiveness. There's no forgiveness for you. Now, the reason why that uh, comes up with a limited atonement is pretty obvious because you say, well, I thought Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. Right? Because that's what we believe. He did die for the sins of the whole world. And understanding this reprobate doctrine, that's still completely true. The question is, why don't they have forgiveness? Why is that sin unforgivable? Is, is it because Jesus didn't pay for it? Or is it something else? It's not because Jesus didn't pay for it. We need to look further, though, just to get a, a better understanding of this concept. Now, turn, if you would, to... See where I want you to have a turn. Turn, if you would, to John chapter 12. I'm going to read some, just a few other references for you because... This actually isn't the only time. This is the only time where the Bible says like you have never forgiveness in, in these types of words. But it's not the only time the Bible refers to a person that cannot be forgiven of something or that, that cannot be saved. There are other places, too, that the Bible refers to a person who becomes reprobate. Because if someone can't get forgiveness, they're rejected. They're reprobate. That's what it means. Um, Revelation chapter 14, when we see, we see people receiving the mark of the beast. I'll read this for you, verses 9 and 10. The Bible reads, And the third angel followed him, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he should be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest 
day nor night, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. There are no other conditions to this. There are no other um, factors brought up. They say this is it. And if this, if there are people who worship the beast in his image and receive his mark and a forehead in his hand and they don't go to hell, then the Bible's not true. It has to be true. There, there is nothing else that, that, that is applied to this. Read the whole thing in context. See what it says. There are no exceptions. There's nothing else given here that says, well, unless they believe or unless something else. It just says clear as day, look, if you worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or hand, you're going to hell. You're going to be, you're going to be tortured and tormented in hell. So there's something, again, that you could, it doesn't say he hath never forgiveness, but that's what it means. It's saying the same exact thing. Revelation 22, last chapter of the Bible, verse 18, the Bible reads, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Again, another act, another thing that can be done that can just damn you to hell forever. Sealed, done, over, tamper with God's word, change it, add to it, remove from it, done. Three examples in the Bible. You say, well, how could Jesus have paid for the sins of the whole world if there are sins that are unforgivable? Well, I'm going to reread for you from Matthew 12 what, it actually, what the scripture actually says. It says, but whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him neither in this world, neither in the world to come. That sin shall not be forgiven, but why? How do we receive forgiveness of sins to begin with? So in order to understand how it can't be forgiven, how do we become forgiven? Well, John 3, 15, 16 says that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Obviously, we have to believe on Christ in order to receive the forgiveness of sins. Acts 10, 43 says to him, give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. So again, we need to make sure everything fits together in Scripture. If the Bible says clearly, without any doubt, not a parable, that whosoever believes in his name shall receive remission of sins, it shall be forgiven him. But then you see somewhere else that, hey, if you blaspheme the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven you. We need to, we need to figure out some, some circumstances. Say, well, what, what happens then? What happens to a person who blasphemes the Holy Ghost, but then they believe on Christ? Can't have that situation happen, because if you did, you'd have, you, you, you would be stuck with a contradiction, because one of these would have to, to, to break, right? If he says, you never have forgiveness, but then it says, all that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, you can't have it both ways. Or if you say, what if a saved person blasphemed the Holy Ghost? They already receive remission of sins, but now they're not going to be forgiven. So how is that going to happen? Hold on a second. Jonathan, can you come and get him and set her down? Sorry for the distraction. Where was I? You can't have a contradiction in Scripture. So you're either, you're either forgiven or you're not, right? For, for all of your sins or there's something you can't... You, if you're going to have it both ways. And here's, here's what ties everything together as far as the reprobate doctrine is concerned. You, look at John chapter 12, verse 37. John 12, 37. And it fits just fine, but we have to have a proper understanding. John 12, 37 reads, But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. And you know, this is something that that's, I've thought about many times. When you have so many, you know, these people, the Pharisees, fighting against Jesus Christ. 
someone who is recorded to have done all of these wonderful miracles, all of these signs and wonders, raising someone back to life from the dead. I mean, things that you can't uh, fake. Things that weren't, you know, people in an entire community knew that this man was lame on his feet, right? Couldn't walk from birth. All of a sudden, Jesus, up, Jesus goes to him and says, you know, be thou healed. And immediately, you know, he's, he's walking up and he's jumping around and has strength in his legs. His muscles weren't, you know, even if you could say he healed him somehow, his muscles weren't, wouldn't have the strength for him to jump up and leap for joy and walk around and everything. If somehow Jesus had a way of deceiving them and, and healing him through some knowledge that he had that no one else had, there's no way. I mean, there's no physical way he could have done the miracles that he did. They are beyond explanation, beyond scientific explanation. They are miracles of God because he had the power of God in order to heal people, to raise them back from the dead and do the things that he did. He, this was witnessed by many, 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 many people. This is not something that can just be easily discounted. This is why we have our calendar system based after a man, Jesus Christ. We're in the year 2017, Anno Domini. The year of our Lord. Because of the impact that he had on the world. Because it wasn't just some false prophet somewhere who made some claims and that some cult followed. It's a very real existence in Jesus Christ and the works that he did were recorded by more than just the Bible also. There are other historical books that will reference Jesus Christ and, and who he was and the impact that he had in this world. But even though he was doing this, the, the, these miracles before people, they still did not want to accept it. They believed not on him. Verse 38, that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed. Therefore, they could not believe, because that Isaiah said again, he hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart that they should not see with their eyes nor understand with their heart and be converted and I should heal them. Clearly stating that if a person sees with their eyes, if a person understands with their heart and is converted, they will be healed. Because that's what the Bible says all throughout the scripture. Whosoever believeth shall be saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall I call on him whom they not believe, right? This is, this is how a person gets saved. But he says, in order to prevent that, he's blinded their eyes and hardened their heart. When God hardens someone's heart, he makes it so that they cannot believe. So you don't have this conundrum. And look, this, is clearly, this isn't something I just came up with out of my own head. This is something that the Scripture clearly states. So it's not just me trying to reconcile Scripture by coming up with something to make it work. It says here that when somebody is their heart is hardened, they cannot believe. So now all of a sudden, oh, well, this could make sense. If someone blasphemes the Holy Ghost, then God could harden their heart, and there is no more potential contradiction of, well, what happens if they believe? Because they can't. God has made it impossible. That choice is no longer theirs. Done. And it's not that hard of a stretch to say, well, if someone has already received everlasting life, that they can't blaspheme the Holy Ghost. We have scripture, it says, you know, that, that the, the, the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. We have the Holy Spirit inside of us. We also have Matthew 24, which I brought up earlier, that says, essentially it says it's not possible for those that are saved to be deceived by the Antichrist. It's just not possible. It's something that is impossible because we have the light, because we have that knowledge and, and we have the Spirit of God. It's, it's just something that you can't do. So taking the mark of the beast, no one's going to do it because they're not going to be, no, no believer, excuse me, no believer is going to do that because they're not going to be deceived. It's just not going to happen. No, um, no believer is going to blaspheme the Holy Ghost and say that Jesus is of the devil. I mean, that doesn't even make any sense anyways. I mean, you want to come up with a hypothetical situation. Someone who you are trusting in for your entire soul and salvation, you're going to say he's of the devil? Doesn't make any sense. That, someone, that anyone who's believing in Jesus, is trusting Jesus, is going, to, is going to say or do that at all. 
And then the same thing with tampering God's word and changing it and making, you know, and, 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 you know, taking and removing from it. A believer is not going to do that. Again, it doesn't even make sense that they would. Turn if you would to Romans chapter 1. But some people will falsely claim that we believe homosexuality is an unforgivable sin, as if it's like, it's a, as if we're saying, just like blaspheming the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, that if a man lies with mankind, he lies with a woman, he has never forgiveness. That's not what we're saying. That's not the, that's not the case. You're misunderstanding the doctrine and the application. Romans chapter 1 clear, clears it up for us. And ju just to be clear, the, the, the point that we're, what, what our belief is, is that the sin of homosexuality just isn't something that a person even does until after they've already been rejected, until after their heart has already been hardened. And it, all it is is just an evidence. It's something that happens. It's a fruit, if you will, of, of what comes out of a person whose heart has already been rejected by God and they've already been given up on and given over by man. That's why we say that homos can't be saved. It's not because their sin is so vile and disgusting that God just can't forgive it. That's not the point. It is vile and disgusting and an abomination, but it's not, that's not why it's, uh, you know, it's not some new unforgivable sin. It's just a symptom of the real problem, which is they've already been rejected. Look at verse number 20 of Romans 1. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, and his, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. So here's where they have become hardened. Their heart was darkened. That's where it starts. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, which means because of this, because of everything that we just read here, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, so for this reason, God gave them up unto vile affections. So it's because of the fact that their heart was already darkened, because of the fact they knew God, they glorified him not as God, because of this reason, God hardened their heart and he gave them up unto vile affections. Prior to these events happening, God doesn't give you up to vile affections. He doesn't just give everybody, you know, like, it, it's something that's not going to happen. It doesn't happen naturally. This isn't, because it's, it's not a natural sin. It's not something that's a, a natural thing. You have to be given up to become into that situation anyways. So, and, then, and then it clarifies what he means by vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. I'm not making it up and saying that it's unnatural for any person, any human being to want to be with someone of their own gender. That is unnatural. That is not something that is normal. It's not the way that God created us. That even though we have a sinful nature, that is not natural until you've been given over to do those things which are not convenient, which is what it says in the next verse. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burning their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. So, the, the, you know, don't put the cart before the horse. We're not saying that, that this is a sin that is unforgivable and that it's limited atonement and blah, 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 because no, it's just demonstrating that they have been given up on, that they already have denied God, they already have um, worshiped and served the creature more than the creator. That's something that's already happened because we see the result of that. A few more points I'm going to make now. Uh, you know, hopefully that's clear for everybody. I, I don't understand. You know, for a while I, was, I had, I'll be honest with you, when I was first introduced to this doctrine, I had a little bit under, hard time understanding it. Didn't quite have my head wrapped around it completely, but that's just because I didn't have a, a good enough knowledge of the Bible and, and, and good doctrine and really 
look at this stuff carefully because it's easy to read over this stuff. If you're just doing Bible reading, it's harder to get the finer points of some of these doctrines. It's easy to understand people are saved by grace through faith because there's just so many mountains of evidence of Scripture. But when we're talking about some of these finer points of like, you know, someone's heart being hardened, it's not like there's no verses on it. There are definitely enough. I mean, re the word reprobates in the Bible, I don't know, three, five times, something like that. And uh, the concept's there even more. But it's not something, one, that's commonly preached, so you don't hear it that much. And two, it does take a little bit of study just to really figure out what exactly is this saying, even though it's clearly there. Um, but I'm going to go over now a few other things. So limited atonement. They're talking about, you know, God picks and chooses certain people to be saved. And Jesus didn't die for all people. And other people will accuse us of saying, well, God didn't pay for all sins. Didn't Jesus pay for all sins? He did. I believe that Jesus Christ paid for the sins of the whole world, including the sin of blaspheming the Holy Ghost. But nobody will ever receive the forgiveness for that sin because their heart is already hardened and they cannot believe on the Lord Jesus Christ in order to receive the forgiveness of sins. So there still is no conundrum of, did Jesus pay for all the sins of the world? Yes, he did. Every sin. Every single sin that you could commit. Even homosexuality. Doesn't matter if somebody can't be saved, after, you know, and, and that's why they became doing those sins. He still paid for them all. But it doesn't mean that they're going to be applied to everybody because you need to believe in order to have that payment applied to you. And for some people, it simply is too late for them to have that payment applied to them. Now, um, I'm going to read, a I have another excerpt from the, from the page explaining the, the limited atonement. They said, uh, additionally, in the high priestly prayer, Jesus prays for the protection and sanctification of those who believed in him. And he explicitly excludes praying for all. And what they bring up is John 17. I'll read this for you. Uh, you could turn to John if you want. Turn to John 17. You could look at this too because there, the, there's still a few more verses in John that we're going to turn to. I'm going to try to hurry up through the rest of this. I, I, I try to be as clear as possible, especially with that reprobate doctrine. Because it's not like it's work salvation. We're not saying you have to, oh, you have to keep this law and not be a homeowner in order to be saved. No. We're saying if you've done it, you, 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 God's hard your heart. Simple as that. Pretty straightforward. But let's see what they're saying here. John 17, verse 8. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me. This is Jesus Christ praying to the Lord, by the way. And they have received them. And have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. Now, this is a specific prayer that Jesus is praying unto God. And he's specifically calling out, you know what, God, I'm praying for these people. I'm not praying for the world. I'm praying for these people right here. But they point out, well, he excluded the world. Well, if that's the way you're going to read that, I mean, it's not the common reading even of that verse. He's just saying, look, I'm praying for these people right here, right now. Does that say that Jesus never prayed for anyone else in the world because in this one prayer, he's only praying for these people? It's silly. It's ridiculous. Excluding the world from this particular prayer does not alter the desire for the world to be saved either. Making a prayer for someone. Look, I pray for people all the time. If I don't pray for someone, does that mean I just don't want to pray for them ever again and I just wish they would go to hell? No. Or, I mean, I, don't, I can't think of an example where I've excluded someone and saying, you know what, I'm not praying for the Lord. It would be like, it would say, well, I'm not praying for the lost right now, God. I'm praying for these people. Does that mean I don't want the lost to get saved because I'm not praying for them right now? Is that even what he said? He says, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. If what, if what he meant here is that, you know, I don't care about the rest of the world, I'm not praying for the world, and he's excluding them, and that justifies some, some limited atonement, then what about John 3, 17? For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. 
That is the evidence that God wants the world to be saved. And the reason why Jesus came was that the world through him might be saved. But how can the world be saved through Jesus Christ if he didn't pay for all the sins of the world? If he didn't come to be the savior of the world? Right? It just it falls flat on its face. John 17, then verse 10, verse 20, later on in that prayer, he says, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. So now he's opening up the prayer to even more people. He's still not saying he's praying for the world, but he's praying for those that are going to believe later. Um, continuing on with a little bit more of their, their evidence or justification for that limited atonement, uh, th that page said, Paul instructs the elders in Ephesus to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. And he says in his letter, and, and, and forgive me because I'm reading exactly what they have and they're quoting like the ESV or something. It's not the King James, but I have the, I, I'm just going to read for you after this, the King James quotations. Um, Paul instructs the elders in Ephesus to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. And he says in his letter to the same church that Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Likewise, Jesus foreshadows that he will lay down his life for his friends. For his friends, in quotes. And an angel tells Jesus' earthly father, Joseph, that he will, will save his people from their sins. Calvinists believe that these passages demonstrate that Jesus died for the church, that is, the elect, only. Now, they are interpreting it that way, but that's not what these verses are clearly stating. And, I, and I'll read them now for you from the King James, Acts 20, 28. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. That's a true statement. Amen, amen. Jesus Christ has purchased with his own blood the church of God. Does that mean he didn't die for anybody else? No, it just says that he's purchased the church of God with his own blood. That's what that means. Verse Ephesians 5.25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. There is no exclusions there. He's just saying a statement, saying, you know, and, and he's relating that to marriage, right? He's saying, well, Christ gave himself for the church. Uh, John 15, if you're in John, you can look at John 15, because this is another one that they referenced. Verse number 12 John 15, verse number 12, This is my commandment, that ye love one another, as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever I commanded you. And the funny thing is that none of these verses have any indication of exclusivity. That, that these are the only people that, are, that, that he died for, right? It's just making a statement. And if it is exclusive, then you have a problem with contradicting Scripture and the overall spirit of God and his desires. Like we read earlier, you know, God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. For God so loved the world in John 3, 16. Why would he give his son if the world did not have an opportunity to get saved? When was the world, when is the world, and I mentioned this earlier, when has the world ever been used to refer to believers only? Because that's what they're claiming here. <clears throat> The Bible says in 1 John 2, 15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. So just to explain that a little bit further in case you missed what the point I was trying to make. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Calvinists are interpreting the limited atonement that Jesus is only came to die for the sins of those who are saved, meaning only believers, only the elect, however you want to define that, whatever, that's what they're saying. So, if that's the case, then when, God's, when the Bible says, when Jesus Christ said, for God so loved the world, then the world would have to mean the elect in that verse, in that context. That he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth him shall not perish. It doesn't make any sense. Why would God, first of all, why would God love people that he chose from before they were even born to destroy in the lake of fire? That doesn't mean, that's, I mean, how could you ever love them? If God just, just arbitrarily picked and chose through his sovereignty that, that these people are going to go to hell. Doesn't make any sense anyways. And how could he even show that love through Jesus Christ if Jesus Christ didn't come to pay for their sins and pay for the sins of the whole world? That's why 
God so loved the world because Jesus came to pay for the sins of the whole world. The world is not believers. The world is the world. It means what it says. You can't just start redefining words. Last thing we're going to go over tonight. I have a whole other section, but we're just getting way too late on time. I have a whole section on how um, the Calvinist is really very similar to the work salvationist because it's basically the same thing and how the, that affects their pride and their attitude towards other people. I mean, if you think about it, you know, if, if you feel like God chose you, that must mean that you're special over someone else that God chose to go to hell, right? And then you're going to start thinking, well, hey, I'm somebody, you know, I'm better than this person because God chose me and not them. And they start having that type of an attitude like the, uh, like the man, that the Pharisee that went down to the temple said, I thank you, God, I'm not like this publican over here. You know, I'm not an adult, you know, and having that type of an attitude. That's a Calvinist attitude because they think that God just specifically chose you. But the last, uh, turn if you go to Romans chapter 5, the last point I want to make because this was also in there, and it's a logical argument, again, which you're going to find with most Calvinists is that they're going to appeal to man's wisdom and logic more than they're going to appeal to just what the scripture says. And the flaw is, is fundamental in just their premise and their understanding. You get the first part wrong, you get all crazy on some, on some rabbit trail, and you could have other logic that does make sense, but when, you, when your foundation is wrong, when you're starting off with a wrong assumption, a, a wrong direction, then you know, it's, it's just screwed up from there on out. So I'm going to read this last point for you. They say, the doctrine of limited atonement is often argued from the theological argument of double jeopardy. In the limited view, Jesus Christ has taken the penalty of the elect, that Jesus died for those who would believe, so that those for whom Christ died must be saved and cannot be damned, as it would be unjust for God to punish the same sins twice. And that's their double jeopardy. If Jesus died for all, they argue, then all must be saved. The penal theory of the atonement is therefore the basis of the necessity for a limited atonement. And I think that's really where their argument stems from, is from this type of human wisdom and understanding. They need to derive this doctrine and prop it up with Scripture somehow. That's my personal thought, and I don't know where it actually originated from and what was going on in their head. But I would guess it's something like this. Someone who's sitting back and thinking, well, let's see, if Jesus paid for their sins, then God can't punish them because he's already punished Jesus for them. It's not fair for God to do that. He's a just judge. He can't just go and, and send someone to hell now when Jesus already paid for their sins on the cross. And, this, and that's a big problem for them. So because they can't comprehend that thought in their mind of how that could be, then they just forget all the rest of the scripture. I'm going to come up with something and try to find verses that are saying what, what makes sense to me. Instead of letting the Bible teach you, you are now just trying to use scripture to enforce your own understanding and your own fleshly wisdom. You're in Romans chapter 5. Look at verse number 15. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one the condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound." I want to point out there verse number 18. The latter part, it says, Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men on the justification of life. I'm not going to try to change what the Bible says there. It says all men. 
So the free gift came upon all men, then it came upon all men. The free gift, it came upon all men, but that doesn't mean that all men received the free gift. The free gift is offered. The free gift came upon him. And that's why it says in the next verse, 19, for as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Not all men, but many shall be made righteous. Why? Because many will receive that gift. Not all, but many. The gift has come upon all people. The gift is there. There for the taking. That gift is bought and paid for already in order for that gift to exist. I mean, it's got to be paid for, right? Jesus had to pay for that gift. And if it came upon all men, then it had to be paid for for all men. The gift's available, but it needs to be applied to you. If you want to receive the atonement of Christ, you know, God is a just judge. Hey, yeah, he has suffered and paid a punishment and a penalty that would be equivalent to what you should pay for your sins, it's still not double jeopardy because you need to have that applied to your account. If you don't receive what someone else has already done, that's no less just of God. He could just say, well, Jesus offered himself to pay for everybody. Whether or not they're going to accept it. That doesn't leave any, you know, that's, that's not unjust. That's, it's, like, it's like saying, I'm going to pay, let's say you walk into a restaurant. Say, I'm going to pay for the tab, for the bill of everybody in this restaurant. And they go and they add it all up. And they say, okay, here's the total. And you pay for that. But then someone else is like, well, no, I don't, I don't want him to pay for my food. I want to pay for my food. But it's already been paid for. So well, I want to pay for it. And they pay for it anyways. And there's nothing, you know, there's no contradiction there. This has already been paid for, but you want to pay for it yourself. You didn't accept the payment that I made for you. Then you pay for it yourself. That's fine. I mean, it's, and I know it's not the perfect example. I, I get it, but... The free gift was bought and paid for. And it's, there's no injustice of God to hold someone responsible because they didn't use the, 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 the free gift that was offered. First right. John 2.1 says, My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is a propitiation for our sins and not for ours only but also for the sins of the whole world. Their logical argument falls apart when you just look at clear scripture. Well, how could God hold someone responsible when Jesus rises right paper? Well, that can't be the case, so then we have to come up with this, this doctrine. Why don't you just try reading the Bible? He's a propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Not the elect, the whole world. Again, nowhere can you prove from Scripture that the whole world ever equals the elect. The whole world ever equals believers. They're two diametrically opposed concepts. The world versus believers, versus the saints, versus the elect, whatever term you want to use there. And think about this, it's not just forgiveness of sins that we need anyways, but we need righteousness also. If, uh, Romans 4, 6 says, Even as David also described it, the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. So, yeah, I'm not going to get into that last point. We've gone long enough on this. And um, I'll be honest with you. I, for as academic as the Calvinists think they are, and, and for all the big words they like to use, and, and for all the, the study of theology that they do, and everything else, this topic is boring for me, and I hope you don't let someone deceive you and twist your head around because they sound so smart, and they sound like they know what they're talking about, and they could use the large words and the fancy, you know, talk about all these other people who had these beliefs, and John Calvin, John Wesley, and, and, and these fathers of the faith, and they believe this, and Let's just let the Bible speak for itself. Study to show yourself approved unto God, 
Study so that you cannot be uh, deceived by the, by the cunning craftiness and sleight of hand by these men that lie in wait to deceive. Because they're out there. They're trying to shatter your faith in the Bible and in God. And they come up with all this nonsense to try to show you contradictions. And they'll show you, you know, all this other stuff. And this damnable heresies of Calvinism. Saying that, that God is a God that picks and chooses people at random or what, for whatever reason. That they're just going to hell and this one's going to heaven. That is not the God of the Bible. The Lord's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much that you are a loving God, that you've loved the whole world, Lo loved every person that you created, dear Lord, enough to send your Son to pay for their sins on the cross. God, we love that you're such a loving God. I pray that you would please help us to just squash this false doctrine from anybody that, that might be caught up into it, that doesn't know you, that doesn't understand you because they, they think that you're some kind of monster that just sends people to hell for no reason or because it's on a whim or whatever, but that it's, it's not for something that's just, like we know is the truth, Lord. We know that you love us enough to offer us up a free gift of salvation and that everything's been bought and paid for. We just have to receive it. I believing on the name of Jesus Christ, Lord. We've done that here today, and we, and we thank you so much for it. Help us to express that gift unto others. Help us to point out that gift to others that they might receive it also, dear Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.